What's up everybody? So good to connect with you for another word therapy. I pray that all is well with each of you, whether you're watching this live or on some other day. It's a blessing to spend this time with each of you. Tonight we're closing out our series on getting in shape. I hope this has been a blessing to you. We're setting the groundwork for all of us to get activated in our God-given purpose. This will also be the closeout of our first season of Word Therapy. This is episode 25 and we're grateful that God has allowed this ministry to be birthed and to be a blessing to so many people. I want to shout out all of you who have reached out and sent letters and text messages and emails and communicated just how much this time that we share has impacted your life. I love hearing the testimonies of how God has worked through the word therapy experience. And all I can say is to God be the glory. And I can't wait for us to kick off season two in just a couple of months. In the meantime, go back. Please listen to some of the teachings that you may have missed from season one. Share it with someone so that they might be blessed as well. In fact, you can start right now by doing something for me very quickly. I need you to hit that like button so that we can get the message out to those who may not be connected to us. By hitting that like button, you help us to do just that so that we can get into that YouTube algorithm. That's very helpful when you do that. And then don't forget to share this. Send the link out so that others can join the Word Therapy crew as well. So I'm excited to teach tonight. I know this is going to be a major and impactful teaching. So let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. And God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We know, God, that there were so many things that many of us had to overcome just to, to make it to log on tonight. But we thank you, God, that indeed you are the one that allowed us to make it. We pray, God, that you would bless our time together, that you would speak into our hearts and our minds this day what you would have us to know so that we might go forth in the world and give you glory in our walk with you. We thank you, God. We love you. We give your name, the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So let's deal with this last letter in the word shape. You know, we've been using the word shape as an acronym. And tonight we're going to look at that last letter, that E. And the E stands for experiences. Tonight I want to talk about experiences. Where have I been? And what have I learned? Because all of that, your spiritual gifts, your passions, your ability, your personality, and your experiences, it all shapes you for purpose. All of that wires you and gets you ready for what God has called you to do. First of all, when it comes to your experiences, the first thing is this. You have to learn to embrace the positive and negative experiences in your life. Remember, your experiences are part of your shape. Not just your spiritual gifts, not just your passion, not just your abilities, not just your personality. Your shape gives you a clue as to your purpose in life. Your shape gives you a clue as to what God has wired you to do. When you find that, it is a place of fulfillment, it is a place of fruitfulness. It is a place of flow. So you have to get to the place where you learn to embrace the positive and negative experiences in your life. Now, life is a combination of good and bad. It's a combination of sunshine and rain, valleys and mountains. In fact, every great movie, there is a protagonist and an antagonist because life is a mixture and you have to learn to embrace the positive and the negative. In fact, a prime example of someone who embraced the good, the ugly and the bad was Joseph. Joseph embraced the good, he embraced the ugly and he embraced the bad. Remember, God told him that he was going to be the leader the prime minister of the land. 
But before Joseph became a leader of the land, he had to go through a lot of negatives. His brothers threw him into a pit. He was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused of rape. He was thrown into prison. So he had to deal with a lot of negativity, right? But not only did he have to deal with negativity, God also gave him some positivity. Because remember, in Potiphar's house, he was promoted. He was, was also blessed in the prison. Not only that, he became the leader of the land. So if you see his life, it is a mixture of both good and bad. You have to get to the place where you are embracing all of it. Now, what we tend to embrace is the good. Like the day you gave birth to your child, you want to embrace that. The day you graduated from school, you, you want to embrace that. Or, or the day you were promoted, you want to embrace that. The day you got married, hopefully you want to embrace the day that you got married. All, all of that is, is good. It is, it is easy to embrace the good. But what we tend to not embrace is negative experiences like the death of a loved one. We don't want to embrace that. Or the day you got fired from the job that you were loyal to, you know, you, you don't really want to embrace that. Or the day he, he served you the divorce papers, you, you don't want to embrace that. Or, or the terminal illness report. A lot of times we want to embrace the good, but we don't want to embrace the bad. What I'm sharing with you is that life is a combination of both. It is a combination of the ugly, it is a combination of the good and the bad. In fact, many of you have heard the saying, all sunshine and no rain produces a desert. If all you have is sunshine and no rain, you get a desert. Life is a mixture. In fact, have you ever noticed that for a plant to grow, you have to have sunshine, you have to have water and dirt. See, a plant cannot grow without some water, without some sunshine, and without some dirt. And many of us want the water. We want the sunshine, but we don't want the dirt. Somebody drop this in the chat and say, you need a little dirt on you to grow. Yes, you need a little dirt on you to grow. And Joseph, he embraced all of that. You can't just embrace the edited version of your life. God wants to use the highlight reel and the low light reel. God wants to use every part of your life. And in order to discover your shape, you have to embrace the good and you have to embrace the bad. You can't just, you know, when, whenever things were good. No, no, no. You, you got to embrace all of it. Now, I remember seasons of ministry when it was tough. Times when it seemed like I was getting attacked on every side. Seasons where I had to deal with unexpected death. Seasons where I had to deal with family challenges. And I'm like, Lord, you know, what's going on? But then also I've had a lot of good seasons. Seasons of growth and, and people getting blessed and, and families doing well. You have to learn to embrace the good and the bad in your life because all of that is connected to purpose. And at the end of Joseph's life, we can tell that he embraced all of it. Look at what Joseph says in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Turn there with me. Genesis 50 and 20. In the New International Version, it says, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see that? So he says, what you meant for evil, God made that work for my good. And that transpired in his life because he embraced all of it. Now, usually we don't embrace pain when we're going through it. And usually we don't discover the purpose of pain like Joseph until later on in life. 
But I want to encourage you with this. God doesn't waste hurt. Did you hear what I just said? God doesn't waste hurt. Everything that you're going through, God is going to use that for a particular time in a certain chapter of your life. So don't tear any chapters out of your book. It is all a part of the bestseller. <laughs> See, oftentimes there are certain chapters we don't want anybody to read, but we need every chapter unredacted. Don't white out or strike through any lines. God says, I need every line, every chapter, every comma, every oops, every bump. I need everything in your life because I'm going to use all of that. Look at the Bible. Let's look at it. Let's look at Romans 8 and 28. You know this passage of scripture. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Help me teach. Encourage somebody with this. Just drop this in the chat. It's working for your good. Some of your most productive days will not be when it's sunshine. It's going to be when it's raining cats and dogs. And you have to learn to embrace the good, the bad, and the ugly. Every chapter, every line, every bump. I know it's painful, but God is going to use that as a part of your shape. And it's going to help you to live a fruitful life and a fulfilled life. So don't cut that chapter out. Go on and put it back in the book. You have to embrace it. So quit complaining about what you're going through. Don't complain about it. Quit resenting what you're going through. I know it's painful. I know it's hard. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You know, in my devotional time this week, I came across Isaiah chapter 45, verse 9. It really blessed me. Let's look at it. It says, what sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot is slain? How clumsy can you be? No, clay pots look at the pot. Don't look at the potter and say, you aren't shaping me right. You have to remind yourself of this. Watch this. You have to remind yourself that we are God's possessions. That means he bought us. We are his and we are his property, right? Now watch this. If we're God's possession, he bought us. If we're God's property, it is his prerogative. He can do what he wants to do with us how he wants to do it, it is his prerogative. And I know you may not like this, but let me bless you with something. His priority is not your pleasure. His priority is your perfection. God is shaping you because his priority in your life is not for you to be comfortable, but for you to have a Christ-like character. And when God looks at your life, and when you don't reflect the fruit of the spirit, God says, like a potter, I've got to spin you a little bit more. I've got to shape you a little bit more so that you can reflect Jesus, so you can talk like Jesus, so you can walk like Jesus, so you can think like Jesus. God is shaping you to be more like Christ. So you have to embrace it. Embrace the shaping, embrace the spinning. He might be spinning you, but the good news is that he still got his hands on you. Oh, did you hear what I just said? That, that was a life jacket and you missed it. The good news is that in the good, the bad, and the ugly, God still has his hands on you. But you got to embrace all of it. I don't know how he's going to use it. But I want you to know that it is working for your good. 
what the enemy meant for evil, it is going to work for your good and for God's glory. All right, let me give you something else. You ready? Every experience is education, so make certain you extract the lesson. Every time you wake up in the morning, school bell has just rung. Every day is school. So you have to make certain you are extracting the lesson. Every experience, every good, every bad, you have to extract the lesson. You have to learn from it. You got to get something out of it. Now, I found this verse. This verse is very interesting. It's, it's talking about Job when he had gone through what he went through. You know, Job went through a terrible experience. He lost his children, lost his job and his friends. They showed up and they basically gave him some advice or some wisdom. And look at what happened. Look at Job chapter 32. We're going to look at verses six and seven. It says, I am young and you are old. So I held back and did not dare to tell you what I think. Verse seven, for those who are older are said to be wiser. Notice they didn't say they are wiser. They are said to be wiser. This is not a scripture of promise. This is a scripture of potential because there are some folks who are old, but still unwise. Joe said, I thought the people who were talking to me had wisdom. In fact, look at verse uh, eight and nine. He said, but it's not mere age that makes men wise. Rather, it is the spirit in a man, the breath of the almighty that makes him intelligent, which means that you can have a whole lot of degrees and still be foolish. I mean, how many people do you know have a lot of experience, but are still unwise? How many people do you know are still flunking the same test? And the reason why they are still flunking the same test is because they don't study in order to pass. If you don't study to pass, you will never learn from it. Everything you go through, you have to get something out of it. And if you don't spend time studying what you are going through, you are probably going to repeat the same mistakes. And here's the thing. Some of us are flunking and it's an open book test. I mean, you already have the answers. The answers are in the word. Come on, y'all. Some stuff you ought to be able to say, been there, done that. Some tricks of the devil, he should not be able to get you in this particular season. Let me tell you something about failure. Failure is integral to success. It leaves clues. If, if you study your failures, it will show you what you've been doing wrong so that you can make better decisions moving forward. So you have to begin to say, Lord, what do I need to learn from this experience? What are you trying to teach me with this experience? Because if you don't learn the lesson, you're going to keep going back through it. You have to extract the lesson because you can have a lot of experience and still be unwise. Wisdom comes when you learn from experiences. But can I tell you another way you get wisdom? not just from your experiences, but somebody else's experiences. That's why we have to do life together because you, you don't want to have to go through everything yourself in order to become a wise person. In fact, uh, look at this verse. I, I love this. Uh, Job uh, eight and nine, uh, in the new living translation. I want to show you this. It says, just as the previous generation, pay attention to the experience of our ancestors, for we were born but yesterday and know nothing. Our days on earth are as fleeting as a shadow. Now, I want to talk to the younger people right now who are watching this. 
I know you think that you know everything, but you don't. Let, let me say it again. I know you think you know everything, but you don't. You need to give certain people a pass who are spiritually mature. And remember, spiritual maturity is not synonymous with age. Spiritual maturity is synonymous with people who are led by the spirit of the Lord. Are you hearing me? You have to let people who are spiritually mature speak into your life. And you have to learn to listen to them. I know you're smart. I know you're intelligent. I know you're erudite. But you just got here. Sometimes you just got to be quiet. Well, if it was me, I would do. No, you don't know. Just listen. Just come to the table and listen, because if you listen, you will learn. And if you learn, you'll be a better leader. See, you're trying to lead when you haven't listened and learned. You have to learn to sit down and listen and learn something so you can be a better leader. And what I'm trying to get you to see is that you can learn some stuff from the previous generation. That makes sense? You gotta do that, you have to listen. Now, now let me flip it and talk to the older folks who are all up in the comments saying, hey man, I see you. Since we are equal opportunity, you can learn something from young folk. Oh, don't get quiet on me now in the chat. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers. There are some things even a younger generation can teach an older generation. What I'm trying to get you to see is we cannot just be a church of Ruth. We need Ruth and Naomi. We need the creativity of a Ruth and we need the wisdom of a Naomi. And when you put a Ruth and a Naomi together, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God is going to make happen. God wants us to learn from each other. That is very important. Sometimes the older folk need to listen to the younger generation. It's called reverse mentoring. It is where now the millennial generation is teaching the older generation because they're so high tech. Here's what you have to understand. All professionals have a coach. Go do the research. You're not going to find one pro who doesn't have a coach. Who do you have in your life if you're older or younger who's speaking into your life? You got to have that. All right, let me keep going. Here's the last thing I want to share with you. The experiences you go through should equip you to be a model, a motivational speaker, and a qualified minister. I'm getting something out of my experience. What I'm going through is equipping me to be a model. It's equipping me to be a motivational speaker. It is equipping me to be a qualified minister. That's why you have to embrace it all. The good, the bad, the ugly, because it's equipping me. It's making me ready to be a model. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about being a model. Let's look at John chapter nine, verse one. It says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse number three. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed, underline that, displayed in him. Everything bad that happens in your life is not the result of sin. It's not a result of punishment. It's not because you made a mistake. Some things happened because God picked you. 
Well, why did God pick me? Look at the last verse. So that the works of God might be, here it is, displayed. In the New Revised Standard Version, it says, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. In the New Living Translation, it says, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Do you see that? Here are the key words, displayed, revealed, seen. See, what many of us don't realize is that our experience is nothing but a display a trophy case to show how good and powerful God is. And God is going to use your suffering to be a model to let people know, not only will I send you through stuff, but I will also bring you to a place where others can see the power of God working through you. Remember that woman with the issue of blood? I've been talking about it all series long, the Bible says that this woman was bleeding for 12 long years. And sometimes we miss the miracle. But think about it, y'all. If she was bleeding, that meant for 12 years, she's losing blood. After 12 years, she touched the hem of Jesus's garment. She touched the H-E-M. And because the H-E-M was touching the H-I-M, she got healed. You remember we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but that's not even the celebration. The celebration is that she survived 12 years of bleeding. See, some of you don't even realize that your greatest shout is not that God brought you out. It is that you didn't die when you were in it. Oh, y'all got to get this. You were in some stuff that you that should have killed you. It, it should have drowned you. It should have taking you out, but some way, somehow, you survived all the hell you went through because God is using not your deliverance, but your survival as a display of his glory. Go on and testify right now to your brothers and sisters in the chat. Tell them you don't have a clue what I survived. How many of you can thank God? Not that I got out of it, but thank God that you didn't die in the middle of it. When you were a part of that cuckoo relationship. When you were with friends who were stabbing you in the back. After all you went through, you still have a pulse. <laughs> You're still in your right mind. Some of us can only celebrate God when we come out. But I wonder if there are 27 of you all in chat who are grateful tonight because you survived in it. That's why you have to embrace it all. Because God is using your experiences to manifest to the world how strong he is. God is making you a model. Let me keep going. Not only are you a model, but he's equipping you through your experience so you can be a motivational speaker. So he's not just taking you through experiences so that you can be a model. He's taking you through experiences so that you can be a motivational speaker. What do you mean, pastor? Let me show it to you. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, what a wonderful God we have. He is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of every mercy and the one who so wonderfully comforts us and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. Do you see that? Now, now look at the next clause. It says, and why does he do this? Why does he strengthen me? Why does he encourage me? Why does he comfort me? Here it is. Look at it. So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them this same help and comfort God has given to us. God is getting you ready to be a motivational speaker. One of the most powerful ways of saying something is through personal experience. Are y'all still with me? See, it's one thing for me as a pastor to talk to you and to encourage you. 
But when you connect with a group of people and you start talking about what God has done in your life, that's different. Why do you think companies enlist testimonies from celebrities? You know, if you have a pimple, just put a little proactive right here and it's going to go away. They do it because the most powerful way of saying something is through personal experiences. God sent you through what you went through so that you could be a motivational speaker so that you could give somebody hope so that you could give somebody encouragement God is taking you through stuff because he wants you to be in a position to give people hope the best people who can give other people hope on how to survive a marriage is people whose marriages have survived the best people to give people hope on how to experience loss without losing their minds is somebody who experienced loss but didn't lose their mind or who lost their mind but got it back. The best person to help somebody who is going through a fiery situation is somebody who smells like smoke. And somebody in your life, somebody watching right now is a witness who can say, I've already been on that roller coaster. It was rough. It had all kinds of loops and turns, but I rolled the ride and somehow, some way, God helped me make it through. And that's why you have to embrace all of it. That's why you have to embrace the good, the bad, and the ugly, because God is going to use that to equip you to be a motivational speaker so that when you look behind you and you see a single mom who's like, how am I going to make it? You'll be able to tell them you're going to make it because I made it. I didn't raise two children. I raised five of them and they're all in school and doing well. God is setting you up to be a motivational speaker. Okay, here's the last one. God sends you through experiences so that you can become a qualified minister. Not a textbook Christian. Not, not that I just read something. No, I'm talking about a qualified minister. Your experiences are qualifiers. Let, let me show it to you. Look at Philippians uh, chapter 1 verses 12 through 14. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that when, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul was in jail, chained to a Roman guard who didn't know Jesus. Hold up. He was chained to a guard 24 hours a day. And because of the chains, the guard changed. Y'all didn't get it. Because of the chains, the guard changed. Some of y'all don't even realize why you're in certain groups at work. God says, I've chained you to that person because they need to change. You've been asking them, move me from this cubicle. Please move me from this cubicle. And God says, your boss didn't put you there. I did. And the reason why I put you there is because there is a man, there's a woman who needs to know who I am. And everything that I've taken you through, I'm going to need you to minister to them. Y'all, this messed me up. Paul is in jail. And while he's in jail, he writes a letter. He writes a letter about what he had been going through. This is going to bless you. If you don't share your pain... The only thing you're going to get out of pain 
is pain. But if you share your pain, somebody will profit from what you went through. But if you keep that to yourself, somebody who needs encouragement, somebody who needs hope, they will not benefit. Listen, we're not encouraging you to get in small groups in the fall just to give you something to do. I'm not just asking you to get engaged in ministry just to get in ministry. I'm encouraging you to do those things because somebody needs to hear that Jesus has power, that Jesus will forgive you, that Jesus will give you another chance, that Jesus has plans for your life. And if they look at you, they'll be able to say, if he can do it, if she can do it for you, if he can do it for you, I just believe that God can do it for me. Listen, get this. Paul wrote most of the New Testament in jail. When you read back through Philippians, Colossians, all of those scriptures, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was in jail. He shared his experience while he was in jail. It, it, it reminds me of uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter. Y'all remember that movie? Y'all remember Denzel in that movie? Uh, Reuben Carter was a boxer who was thrown in jail for something he did not do. And while he was in jail for something that he didn't do, the story goes that he wrote a book. And when he wrote a book, he called it the 16th round. It was an autobiography about his life. He wrote the book and it just so happened that the book was sent to a bookstore. And a young orphan by the name of Lesra Martin was in the bookstore and picked up the book. When he picked up the book, he began to read the story about Reuben Hurricane Carter, who did not keep his pain to himself, but he took his pain and put his pain in a book. And it just so happened that Lesra, who is an orphan who did not have hope, read the book. And when he read the book of Reuben's life, Lesra found hope. What I'm trying to get you to see is that we have the New Testament, we have the Old Testament, and we have the Third Testament. You're wondering what the Third Testament is. The Third Testament is you. Paul says we are living epistles, which means that somebody may never read the Bible, but when they look at your life and begin to read every page, they gain knowledge of the Lord. That's why you ought not tear any pages out of your book, because there is a Lesra who needs to read every chapter and they don't just need to read chapter 19. They need to read chapter five when you lost all hope, chapter nine when you were almost getting ready to throw in the towel, but somehow God showed up and turned your life around. You have a story to share. Help me in the chat, just say, share your story. Your story should enrich the lives of people who read it. Your story should build people. Your story should direct people. Your story should tell people about the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God. You have a story to tell. Old song says, y'all remember, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation purchased by God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Here it is. This is my story. Every door that was shut, every valley, every mountain, every lie, it is working for your good. God was shaping you. God was molding you. God was getting you ready for such a time as this. And what the enemy meant for evil, he is making it work for your good. I tell you, it is working. It is working. It is working for your good. Quit fighting your shape and start embracing it. Every lie they told on you, every time they stabbed you in the back, it is working 
for your good. And the reason why God has to do that is so that you can know your shape. Because if you don't know your shape, you don't know where you fit. You have to embrace it all. You have to accept everything that you've gone through. I'm telling you, God has a plan. God is up to something in your life. God doesn't want us to just exist. He wants us to live on purpose. If you surrender to God, if you give him your heart, God will bless you like you've never been blessed before. Listen, the pot doesn't tell the potter, why are you doing that? No, the pot sits there and allows the potter to shape him. God is getting you ready for something. That's why God put it in your spirit to watch this teaching. That's why you're connected to this ministry. Because God is trying to shape you. See, you didn't have the right perspective on what you were going through. But now you can see that all of it is by design. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And what the enemy intended for evil, God is making it work for your good. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's pray. And God, we thank you that everything that we have gone through, every experience that we have had, nothing is wasted. That God, you use everything. You use the good, you use the bad, and you use the ugly in order to shape us and mold us toward our purpose. Thank you that even through the roughest experience of our lives, you've never taken your hands off of us. And because your hands are on us, we have great confidence that we will be able to make it through whatever we go through, whether it's through the fire, through the flood, through the earthquake, whatever it may be, God, as long as your hands are on us, we have the faith that we'll make it through. And when we get to the other side, we'll be made the better because of it, because you have shaped us and molded us into the fit that you have called us to be in, the purpose, oh God, that you called us to live into. God, we thank you. We love you. We give your name the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, that concludes this shape series. And that also wraps season one of Word Therapy. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope this has been a blessing to your life. If you missed any of the 25 lessons from season one, please go back and be blessed by that on this YouTube channel. Not only that, I want you to take the knowledge you have gained and begin to apply that as wisdom to your life. We've got some things that are coming up in the fall at Covenant that's going to help you with that. Look out for those small group signups in September. Listen, we're, we're off for the month of August. We'll be back uh, for fall revival in the month of September with some powerful preachers and teachers who will pour into us. And then we'll be starting season two of Word Therapy in the month of October. Look forward to that. Don't forget that you can join us each Sunday at 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. for our worship services on Facebook Live and live stream. We always have a good time in the Lord. Finally, I want to invite you tonight, if the Lord has moved on your heart, to sow into the ministry of Covenant United Church of Christ. The lower third is on the screen. We'll be ever so grateful for the gifts that you sow into the field from which you are harvesting as we seek to be a blessing in all that we are doing in ministry your gifts go a long way in helping us to do just that and not just tonight but i want you to encourage you to make giving a habit 
Giving should not be transactional. It should be a part of your devotion and discipline that you build into your life and your walk with Christ. Uh, just because we won't be on doesn't mean that we stop giving and we stop following and obeying the word of God. Listen, I love you in the Lord. Praying that you will have a safe and enjoyable August. Until we meet again, uh, be blessed. Have an incredible week, an incredible summer. We love you. God bless you. I see.